happy to have a long-term future, we must ultimately leave Earth. The book is called The Future of Humanity, Terraforming Mars, Interstellar Travel, Immortality, and Our Destiny Beyond Earth. And Prof Professor Michio Kaku joins us now. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Glad to be on. Um, so in the, your new book, you write that it is inevitable that uh, humanity will meet its end, the Earth will become inhabitable for humans, and that we can either leave, adapt, or die. This all sounds scary. When and how is all of this happening? Well, you know, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. That's why they're not here today. They didn't have Plan B. They didn't have an insurance policy. We do have Plan B. We have a space program capable of going to the moon, Mars, and perhaps even beyond. Now, NASA, of course, has been criticized for being the agency to nowhere. It doesn't go anywhere. That's all changed. Get this, starting next year, we go back to the moon. That's official now, December 2019, back to the moon, and then Mars, and who knows, beyond that. And that'll give us an insurance policy, just in case something bad happens. And I want to come back to NASA a little bit more as well. Um, but you view that it is our destiny to explore and to colonize other planets. But some people push back and say, you know what, this Earth has a lot of problems. We need to deal with those right here and right now. Um, why is space exploration and ultimately colonization so important? Well, you know, I once talked to Carl Sagan about this. And he said, look, we've got to settle Earth problems on Earth. These are political problems like global warming. Going to outer space is not going to solve global warming. However, he said, we should become at least a two-planet species because we have to have a settlement there in case something does bad happen to the planet Earth. Meteorite impacts. We can also have super volcanoes. We can also have ice ages take place. And five billion years from now, the sun will eat up the Earth. It's practically a law of physics that one day our days on the earth will be over. And that's why we want to make sure that humanity survives all these disasters. So creating a settlement on Mars, what will that take? That sounds uh, hard. Well, to go to the moon is a piece of cake these days. Three days to the moon, uh, you leave on Monday, come back on the weekends. Now, going to Mars is more difficult. Mars is two years away. Nine months to go to Mars. Then you have to do experiments and wait for the time to be right to come back. Another nine months for the trip back. So we're talking about initially pretty hardy people. These are astronauts. They're trained scientists. They're people who know it's going to be a two years, very serious journey to Mars. So we're looking at video right now from SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk's space exploration company. What will be and what has been the role of private enterprise from billionaire visionaries like Elon Musk and Richard Branson and Steve Bezos? They've changed everything. The price of space travel has gone down because of these billionaires. That moon rocket, uh, the, the Falcon Heavy, millions of people tuned into that Falcon Heavy rocket. That was a moon rocket. And how much did it cost taxpayers? Nothing. It was free because it was paid for by Elon Musk. Now, space travel is so cheap that the movie The Martian, many people saw that movie with Matt Damon, that cost $100 million. However, to go to Mars, the Indians did it with $70 million. So they ought to give an Oscar for the best supporting space probe. Hollywood movies today cost more than sending a probe to Mars. So it sounds like then the, the, the private enterprise is kind of doing some of this research for humanity because they can afford to. That's right. And remember the used car industry? That revolutionized car ownership after the World War II. Well, now we're going to have reasonable rockets, compliments of Elon Musk. You saw that Falcon Heavy takeoff? The two booster rockets came back to Earth ready for the next journey to the moon. And again, that was a moon rocket. That was not the shuttle. That was a moon rocket that blasted off from Cape Canaveral for free. Um, so you write about the idea of terraforming Mars to make it more hospitable for humans and, and more habitable for humans. How, how do you do that? Well, we are actually terraforming the Earth right now with global warming. For the worse, we're actually changing the weather patterns on the planet Earth. We can terraform Mars for the better. We can, for example, in the future, not anytime soon, but launch satellites that will beam sunlight onto the polar ice caps. Mars has plenty of water, but it's in frozen form. We can melt the ice caps by shooting sunlight onto the ice caps so that rivers and lakes 
flow freely on the surface of Mars. Mars once had an ocean the size of the United States of America. That's how much water Mars had, but it's all frozen. We can unfreeze it. Now, this would be a pretty big project, obviously something on a scale that humans have, humans have never undertaken before and require years, years, decades, maybe hundreds of years of commitment. How do we get society and humanity to commit to something that might not be seen until our great, 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 great grandchildren are around? Well, it's going to happen anyway because uh, all of a sudden we have Silicon Valley billionaires financing it. Elon Musk has his... Falcon Heavy Rocket, and also Jeff Bezos, the richest man on Earth, has his own spaceport. He doesn't have to go to Cape Canaveral. He launches from Texas, and he has a fleet of rockets. We may have a traffic jam, a traffic jam over the moon, and uh, we also have Richard Branson of Virgin Atlantic fielding his rocket, which will take tourists into outer space. I wouldn't be surprised if one day people have honeymoons on the moon. Going to the moon is not going to be such a big deal. Three days and you can have this glorious honeymoon on the moon. And to pay for it, Google billionaires are not jumping in. They don't want to be left out either. Why should Bezos and, and Musk have all the fun? They're funding asteroid mining. They want to capture a small asteroid, maybe 50 feet across, mine it for $50 billion worth of platinum and rare earth elements. So Google does not want to be left out either. And that's going to help pay for many of these missions. Now, President Trump, he has declared his mission to uh, send astronauts back to the moon. Do we need to do this as part of research and development on the way to colonizing and, and to building a base on Mars? Well, I'm all for robots. Uh, robots are cheap. They go out and they don't have to come back. However, robots are very limited in what they can do. We've sent several robots to Mars and they still can't dig in the soil. They still can't do basic physics experiments because it's very limited what robots can do. Humans can just blow the whole thing open. We could create a Mars base. We could create all sorts of facilities, power plants, and agricultural centers and farms to make it self-sufficient. Self so we're talking about using genetically modified plants to create farms on Mars so we don't have to ship food to the astronauts. They can grow food with genetically modified plants. Uh, NASA went to the moon 50 years ago, and if you had asked some people then, they thought we'd be living in the space age by now. What happened? Has NASA lost its way? No. What happened was the Cold War was over, and we, we forget the cost of space travel back then. You realize that in 1966, the NASA budget was 5% of the total federal budget. That's unsustainable. 5% of every dollar went to the space program. Now it's point. 5%. And as I mentioned, Silicon Valley billionaires are footing the bill. And so we're talking about a whole new era. Uh, economics have changed totally, and these rockets are reusable. Space travel could go down by a factor of 10. So with the discovery of thousands of planets beyond our solar system, that means the search for other intelligent life, other aliens, um, has intensified. What is the likelihood that we will have definitive proof of this other life? I think that, yeah, I think the aliens are out there. I get a lot of emails from people that say that they've been abducted by flying saucers, so they've met the aliens. I tell them, the next time you're abducted by a flying saucer, steal something. I don't care what it is, an alien paperweight, an alien pencil, steal anything so you have bragging rights afterwards. <laughs> you can prove this actually happened. That's right. So yeah, I think they're out there because we have discovered 4,000 planets going around other stars. On average, get this, on average, every single star you see at night has a planet going around it. On average, 100%. Of the stars you see at night have a planet going around it, and a fraction of them are Earth-like. So I think, yeah, we have twins out there, twins of the Earth. When you go home tonight, look out in the night sky, somebody is looking back. Should be a clear night as well. If we do detect signs of life beyond Earth, especially intelligent life, how, how will that change us? Oh, it'll change us completely. I'll stick my neck out. I think in this century we'll pick up a radio transmission, we'll eavesdrop, on some communication between alien civilizations. Now, are they going to land on the White House lawn and announce their existence? Probably. I don't think so. If you're in the forest, do you go to the squirrels and deer and try to talk to them? 
Well, at first, but eventually you get bored because they don't talk back. In the same way, I think aliens will land on the Earth and kind of get bored with us because we have nothing to offer them. If you see an anthill, do you go down to the ants and say, I bring you trinkets, I bring you bees, I give you nuclear energy, take me to your ant queen, or maybe you want to step on a few of them. So I think that if they're that advanced, we're not on the radar screen. Not just yet. All right. The progressive development of man is vitally dependent on invention. It is the most important product of his creative brain. Its ultimate purpose is the complete mastery of mind over the material world, the harnessing of the forces of nature to human needs. This is the difficult task of the inventor, who is often misunderstood and unrewarded. But he finds ample compensation in the pleasing exercises of his powers and in the knowledge of being one of that exceptionally privileged class without whom the race would have long ago perished in the bitter struggle against the pitiless elements. timeline potentially oh, right, right, right. to go to the moon or Mars and you said did you say as soon as next year can you quantify no, that but then I had a, I had a, my sure, real question I'm just yeah. doing Chris's work sure, sure, yeah but <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the by hopper tests I mean kind of like we, we have the grasshopper program for Falcon 9 yeah. where we just add the rocket take take off and land in Texas out of Texas test site so that would be um, We'll either do that at our South Texas launch site uh, near um, near Brownsville, um, or or do ship to ship. We're not sure yet whether ship to ship or um, Brownsville, but most likely it's going to do at our, happen at our Brownsville location because um, we've got a lot of land with nobody around. Um, so if it blows up, it's cool. Um, but by hopper test, I mean it'll you know go up, you know several miles and then come down. Um, the, ship will, the ship is capable of a single stage to orbit if you if we fully load the tanks. Um, so the, we'll, we'll do um, flights of increasing complexity. Um, we really want to test the heat shield material. Something we like, you know, fly out, turn around, accelerate back real hard and come in hot. Um, to test the heat shield, because yeah, we want to have a highly reusable um, heat shield that's capable of absorbing the heat from uh, interplanetary entry velocities. So, so it's really tricky. Potential, the potential to go to to, to Moon or Mars. What's oh, your yeah, timeline? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, there are a lot of uncertainties on this program, uh, but it is going to be our focus um, after now, now that we're. Almost done with with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. We're gonna uh, uh, level off, as I said, at Block 5 or Version 5. Uh, so there won't be any more major versions of, of Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy. Um, Dragon is also gonna level off at Dragon Version 2. Uh, there might be like point releases, you know, 5.1 or Dragon 2.1 or something like that. But most of our engineering resources will be dedicated to uh, VFR and uh, and so I think that that will make things go quite quickly. Um, the the ship part is by far the hardest because um, that's going to come in from uh, super uh, super uh, super orbital velocities, like interplanet, uh, um, you know, Mars transfer velocities, Earth tra Moon transfer velocities. These these are way harder than coming in from low Earth orbit. Um, I mean, there's there's some. Um, of the, the heating things that scale to the, the eighth power, 
but which I didn't think realized there was anything that scales to eighth power. Um, but it turns out uh, reentry, certain elements of reentry heating, uh, scale to the, at, at the eighth to the eighth. Um, so just yeah, testing that chip out is the real tricky part. The booster, I think, I don't want to get, you know, complacent, but I think we understand reusable boosters, uh, reusable spaceships that can land propulsively. That's that's harder. So we're starting with the hard part first. I don't know. I think it's conceivable that we do our first test flight in three or four years of a you know full up orbital test flight, including the booster. Oh, oh no, we'd go to Earth orbit first. Uh, but it would be capable of going to the moon shortly thereafter. It's designed to do that. You know, we want to be. The, the best way to optimize the cost of unit mass to Mars and back um, is, is to use an all methane system. Or, or technically deep cryo methodologies. So those are the four, the four elements that need to be achieved. So, this, so um, whatever, whatever uh, system is designed, uh, whether by SpaceX or, or, or anyone, we think these are the four features that need to be addressed in order for the system to, to really achieve a, a low cost per, a cost per ton to the surface of Mars. And this is a, this is a simulation of the overall system.
so what you saw there is it's really uh, quite close to what we will actually build. Uh, it will look almost exactly what you saw, like what you saw. Um, so this is not, not, not an artist's impression. These, um, the, the simulation was actually made from the, the SpaceX engineering CAD models. So this is not, you know, it's not just, well, this is what it might look like. This is what we plan to try to make it look like. Um, so in, in the video, you, see, you, you got a sense for what the system architecture looks like. The, the rocket booster and the spaceship um, take off, loads the, the spaceship into orbit. The rocket booster then comes back. It comes back quite quickly, um, within about 20 minutes. Um, and so it, it can actually launch the, 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 the tanker version of the spacecraft, which is essentially the same as the, as the spaceship, uh, but filling up the, the um, unpressurized and pressurized cargo areas with propellant tanks. Uh, so they look almost identical. So this, this also helps lower the, the development cost, which obviously will not be small. Um, and, uh, and then the, the propellant tanker goes up, and it'll go, actually up, it'll go up multiple times, so anywhere from three to five times to fill the tanks of the, of the spaceship in orbit. Um, and then once the, the spaceship is, the tanks are full, the cargo has been transferred, and uh, we reach the Mars rendezvous timing, which, uh, as I mentioned, is roughly every 26 months. That's when the ship would depart. Now, um, uh, over time, there would be many spaceships. You'd ultimately have, I think, upwards of 1,000 or more spaceships waiting in orbit. And so the, the Mars colonial fleet would depart en masse. Um, they're kind of like Battlestar Galactica. You see that thing? That's a good, good show. Um, so it, a bit like that. Um, but it, it actually makes sense. To, to load the spaceships into orbit um, because you've got two years to do so, and then make frequent use of the booster and the tanker to get, get really heavy reuse out of those. And then with the, with the spaceship, you get less reuse because you have to say, well, how long is it going to last? Well, maybe 30 years. So that might be 12 to maybe 15 uh, flights of the spaceship um, at most. Um, so you really want to maximize the cargo of the spaceship um, and and, and reuse the booster and the, the, the tanker um, a, a lot. So, you know, so the, the ship goes to Mars, gets, gets profound, replenished, um, and then returns to Earth. The big story today concerns a milestone in the exploration of outer space. Private enterprise, not taxpayers' money. Private enterprise sent the Falcon Heavy rocket into outer space. A moon rocket. A rocket that is the largest rocket on the planet Earth. The Falcon Heavy is capable of sending astronauts to the moon and then perhaps on to Mars. And some people think that we could be entering a new era, a new era, a golden age in space exploration after a 50-year gap. And then we're going to say a few things about medicine. It turns out that scientists at the University of Pennsylvania have created a memory chip, a chip that could be used for epileptics and people with Parkinson's disease to increase memory by 15%. And the question is, one day will we have a memory chip where you simply push a button and memories come flooding into our brain? And then we'll say a few things about earthquakes. I'll be speaking in Berkeley in a few weeks on a book tour, and it turns out that there's a chance of a gigantic earthquake slicing Berkeley and Oakland in half, perhaps one in three. A 30% chance that perhaps we'll have a gigantic earthquake in the East Bay in the next 30 years. So we'll be talking about the potential of an earthquake. And as I mentioned before, I'll be on a book tour. I have a new book coming out called The Future of Humanity. How about the future of the space program? What does it mean when we go back to the moon starting next year? That's right, December 2019. NASA expects to send the SLS booster rocket with the Orion space capsule to the moon, first in an unmanned launch, and then afterwards astronauts will return back to the moon. And then Elon Musk riding on the tide of success from his Falcon Heavy rocket. Well, he wants to go to Mars. 
That's right. He wants to go to Mars perhaps within 10, 15 years using mainly private funding. And so we're witnessing perhaps a new age in the exploration of space. Well, let's just jump right into some of the top stories of the past week. The big story today is that Elon Musk, a billionaire, the driving force behind SpaceX, Tesla Motors, and PayPal, well, he created with his own funds a gigantic booster rocket, in fact, the biggest rocket on the planet Earth at the present time, the Falcon Heavy, and it had a successful launch. Now, the payload, of course, was a dummy payload because this was just a test, and he put his own Tesla Roadster inside the rocket. And so now for the first time in history, we have a sports car that is in orbit. And who knows, maybe sometimes millions of years in the future, aliens from outer space will intercept it and see what Earthlings used to drive on the highway. So it is a milestone in the history of space exploration because it means that costs are going down. In 1966, the cost of NASA was enormous at the height of the Cold War and the height of the space race. It turns out that the NASA budget in 1966 was about 5% of the federal budget. Now, that is unsustainable. And of course, in the 1970s, funding for NASA collapsed. And that was the end of the moon program. But now, we have several factors coming into play. But the economics of space travel have been changing dramatically. Recently, just a few years ago, the Indians sent a probe to Mars on the first try. This is the first time it's happened that a developing nation has been able to send a probe to the planet Mars on the first try. And the Chinese, not to be outdone, have laid out a program to put a space station in space and then plant the Chinese flag on the moon. NASA, of course, is not too far behind. NASA not just wants to go to the moon, but to create a lunar orbiter. That's right. NASA wants to create a lunar orbiter like the space station that will give us a, a permanent presence in outer space. From that lunar orbiter, NASA wants to create a Mars ship. That's right, a gigantic rocket using ion engines that'll take four astronauts all the way to the planet Mars. When? Well, first of all, starting next year, December 2019, NASA wants to send an unmanned probe around the moon as a practice mission. In 2022, NASA wants to send astronauts back to the moon after a 50-year gap and then sometime in the mid-2030s, NASA wants to go on to Mars. Of course, Elon Musk, using private funds, has his own time frame. He also hopes to get some NASA money for a Mars ship that perhaps will reach Mars maybe 10 years before NASA does. And so we may have a traffic jam. Eventually, we may have a traffic jam over Mars given the fact that Silicon Valley billionaires have their own timetable. And speaking about Silicon Valley billionaires, Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com, well, he's created his own rocket base in Texas. That's right. He was too impatient to wait for uh, rockets to be launched from Cape Canaveral, so he created his own launch pad in Texas and his own rockets. He has a fleet of rockets that, first of all, will take tourists into outer space and then into orbit and finally on to the moon. And he also has a vision of the future. For Elon Musk, he wants to create a multi-planet species. He says it is simply too dangerous to put life on one planet. We need an insurance policy. We need to make sure that humanity can survive even if there's a catastrophe that hits the planet Earth. That's the vision given to us by Elon Musk, a vision that, of course, comes to us from many science fiction writers like Isaac Asimov and scientists like Carl Sagan. However, Jeff Bezos has a different vision. His vision is, when you look at all the polluting plants on the planet Earth, well, why not put them in outer space? Why not take all the heavy machinery and all the pollution, put them in outer space, and make the Earth into a park? 
So this, for the same reason that in cities we try to concentrate the industrial areas in one place and we try to make the center of the city into a park, why not make the earth into a park? Already, uh, Jeff Bezos has stated that he wants to create a delivery system to the moon. Just like Amazon.com can deliver products right to your doorstep, he wants to create a similar system that will take hardware between the earth and the moon. Well, the next step, as I mentioned before, is the planet Mars. Now, it's not going to be an easy journey. It only took three days. That's a hop, skip, and a jump. Three days to go from the Earth to the moon. However, it's going to take two years to go to the planet Mars. And so we're talking about a major commitment of funds, a major commitment of space hardware to go to Mars. First, it'll take about nine months to reach the red planet. And once we're on Mars, we have to do experiments and wait for the stars to line up for the return journey. And then we come back with another nine-month journey. And when you add up all the months in space, it turns out it's about two years. Now, that's an awful long time, given the fact that the world's record, the world's record for being in orbit continuously is just a little bit over one year. And that was set by Commander Polikov of Russia. And when he came back to the Earth after one year of weightlessness, he could barely crawl like a bug. There was so much atrophy of his muscles that he couldn't even walk when he got out of the space capsule. That means that our Martian astronauts are going to have to exercise all the time. Now, what do we do when we get there? We're talking about perhaps a permanent presence on Mars. First of all, there are lava tubes on Mars that are naturally forming, caves formed by ancient volcanoes, and they can be used as a basis for a Mars base. Because Mars is, well, it's radioactive. There's a lot of radiation from the sun and cosmic rays from outer space, and we have to shield our astronauts from the hazards of the of radiation. We should also point out that it's very cold on Mars, and the atmosphere is very thin. The atmosphere is only 1% the atmospheric pressure found on the planet Earth, and you can't breathe that atmosphere because it's carbon dioxide. So the next big step would be the terraforming of Mars. That is, taking Mars as a frozen desert, injecting, for example, methane gas to speed up a greenhouse effect, to heat up Mars, and then perhaps have gigantic solar mirrors to melt the polar ice caps. This, of course, is science fiction, and it may take decades, decades before we can do this, but it does mean that at some point we may be able to have a self-sustaining colony on Mars. For example, algae and plants. You can genetically modify algae and plants so they can thrive in the Martian atmosphere. Plants, of course, love carbon dioxide. They would have to be genetically modified so they can live in the very cold atmosphere of Mars. And then it may be possible to create self-sustaining agriculture, that is, plants and food stocks that are grown indigenously on the red planet. Well, what about the pros and cons? What about the costs? What about the dangers? What about the benefits of all this? Find out more by getting a copy of my latest book, The Future of Humanity, which gets into the pros and cons of the space program and the vision given to us by these space-age pioneers who are opening up their checkbooks in order to explore outer space. Also, speaking about the Earth and Mars, we should say something about earthquakes. That's right. It seems that recently we've had a series of earthquakes in Japan, in the Philippines, in Taiwan. And some people say, is there a link between all these different earthquakes? Well, yes and no. They're all part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, which extends from Chile up to the coast of Mexico, through California, up to Alaska, into Japan, down into the Philippines. And when you get a chart and you map all these different earthquakes, you find that most of them lie along the Pacific Ring of Fire. Now, is there a link between them? Probably not, because this Pacific Ring of Fire, in turn, 
consists of many short segments, fault lines, and one fault line does not necessarily trigger another fault line. But hey, we're still children when it comes to understanding the dynamics of earthquakes and whether or not one earthquake could in principle set off another. At the present time, the consensus is probably no, but who knows, time will tell. Well, here's a new news story coming from Berkeley, where I'm going to be next month on a book tour. It turns out that the Hayward Fault goes right underneath the football stadium. In fact, I used to go there often when I was a Ph.D. student at Berkeley years ago, and the stadium is slowly being ripped apart. That's right. The stadium sits on top of a fault line, and the Berkeley Stadium is, in fact, being slowly ripped apart. Well, here's a new study that came out just a few days ago. The probability of a major earthquake along the Hayward Fault is one in three over a 30-year period, which means that within the lifetime of many of the people listening to this radio program, we're going to see major catastrophes in California. First of all, we should point out that perhaps the weakest link in the whole chain is the San Andreas Fault north of San Francisco. That is one of the weakest links in the chain. But, of course, we have the San Andreas Fault that goes right through the Bay Area and an offshoot, the Hayward Fault, that goes underneath uh, the University of California at Berkeley, where I got my Ph.D. so many years ago. So now we can begin to calculate the chances of these earthquakes. We're getting better at this. However, it's still black magic trying to predict when the big one will take place. But the consensus that I get by talking to seismologists and by reading their studies is that we are overdue. That's right. We are overdue for another big one. Not just one, but perhaps several. So in other words, a word to the wise, in the lifetime of many of the people listening to this radio show, you may see the big one. You may see parts of Los Angeles, parts of San Francisco in the Bay Area, parts of Berkeley ripped apart by an earthquake exceeding 7.0 on the Richter scale. For example, the Hayward Fault last sustained a major earthquake in 1868. And so memories are short. We have no memories of these gigantic earthquakes that took place in the 1800s, and we've been lulled to sleep because we only had the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, but hardly another big one on that scale. But it's inevitable. It's inevitable that we're going to have not one, but perhaps several big ones in California. Think about that. Uh, it didn't have enough to rewind the, um, 
got all three engines. Uh, and, and sure enough, um, there was something called TTAP, Triad, the Lunar, Triad, the Boron. It's used to light the engines. So it, um, I mean, the, the center one that I believe in the outer two did not. Um, and that was not enough to slow the case down. Apparently, it hit the water room 300 miles an hour. Um, and uh, took out two of the engines of the car. <laughs> So, if you forgot the footage, but I saw like, some pretty fun footage. <laughs> so if, if the cameras didn't get blown up as well, then we'll do that up um, for uh, you know, a real. Um, but that, that's the idea. We weren't going to reuse the set that, that center for anyway. Um, uh, or, or the two side views. So side views, we'll figure out some place to put them. But, um, since they're not uh, block 5 or version 5, uh, we were planning for you saying any of those, of course. Um, the upper stations have worked um, perfectly so far. Uh, the two buttons were executed correctly. And um, they will see if uh, the upper stage API can survive a quite an arduous trip uh, through the Van Allen belts. Uh, normally, uh, uh, stage will pass very quickly through the Allen belts. Here it's essentially dwelling now, um, of course, for several hours. Um, and then it's going to do a restart, uh, uh, complete its propellant, and go to transmogs uh, ejection, which is basically very minor. Um, so it has plenty of propellant to complete the uh, transmogs ejection, assuming that uh, Fuel doesn't freeze, and the oxygen doesn't blow, oxygen doesn't blow, and the electronics don't get fried. <coughs> so those are the issues. Um, we'll find out in a few hours if that that was successful. <coughs> um, I think there's anything else I know that's worth worth mentioning. Um, I went out. I went out to the landing zone. Took a look at the side boosters. Um, they look in a really good condition. Um, so they're, they're both reflyable, uh, although, as I said, they're a um, combination of version 3 and version 4. So we will, <coughs> we're only going to be reflying really version 5 at, at this point. Uh, that, that launches shortly. And that, that'll be our mainstay. We'll, we'll stick to version 5 for the Falcon architecture. We don't expect to have a version 6. Uh, all right, any questions that I haven't answered? I'll, I'll do my best to answer them, but I'm not sure if I have the information yet, but I'll try. Uh, teachers, I guess, told me like crazy things can come true. Um, like, cause I, uh, he'd said like, I didn't really think this would work. Um, cause I, when I see the rocket lift off, I see like a thousand things that, that could not work. And it's amazing when they do. Um, and I was really, the, the, seeing the two boosters land synchronized really just like the simulation um, I mean it makes me think like you really that could be quite a scalable approach you know just coming in landing taking off landing doing many flights per day um, so it, I think it gives me a lot of faith for our next architecture the, the sort of the interplanetary uh, spaceship um, you have different names for it but BFR is kind of a code name, and I, I, it gives me confidence that BFR um, is really quite workable. Um, I was actually looking at the side boosters and like they're pretty big, you know, they're 16 stories tall, uh, 60 foot leg span. Um, but you really, we need to be way bigger than that. Um, so. So I think uh, it's given me a lot of confidence that we can make the uh, BFR design work. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've expressed confidence, obviously, in the SpaceX team. So I think I think we can really do this a lot, you know, and and, and keep advancing the. the Keep advancing the technology to achieve um, full and rapid reusability. Um, and um, but we know we didn't really test any of those materials for you know is it space hardened or whatever you know. So 
It just has the same seats that like a normal car has. It's just literally a normal car in space, which I kind of like the absurdity of that. Um, and if you look closely, there's a, on the dashboard, there's a tiny Roadster with a tiny spaceman. <laughs> so, because Hot Wheels made a Hot Wheels Roadster, and a, and a friend of mine uh, it, um, suggested, hey, why don't you put that Hot Wheels Roadster with a tiny spaceman on the, you know, in the car too? I'm like, that'd be cool. Sure. <laughs> so we did that. Um, I mean, it's kind of silly and fun, but I, uh, I think, I think that's, you know, silly fun things are important. Um, and normally for a new rocket, you know, they'd launch like a block of concrete or something like that. I mean, that's so boring. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's just the imagery of it is something that's going to get people excited around the world. Um, and it's, it's still tripping me out. I mean, I'm tripping balls here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the great thing is, like, so Falcon Heavy uh, opens up a new class of payload. Um, so it, it can launch uh, more than twice as much payload as any other rocket in the world. So it's kind of up to customers what they might want to launch. But it can launch things direct to Pluto and beyond. Um, you know, no, no stop needed. Um, you don't even need, like, a gravity assist or anything. And uh, it can launch giant satellites. Um, it can do anything you want. Um, you could go back. You could send people back to the moon with a bunch of, you know, if you did a bunch of launches of Falcon Heavy and did an orbital ref refilling, um, the two, two or three Falcon Heavies, you, you know, would equal the payload of a Saturn V. Um, but I wouldn't recommend doing that because I think the new architecture, BFR architecture, is the way to go. Um, but I think it's it's going to open up a sense of possibility. I think it's going to encourage um, other companies and countries to say, hey, if SpaceX, which is a commercial company, can do this, and no, nobody paid for Falcon Heavy, it was paid for it with internal funds, um, then uh, then they, they could do it too. So I think it's going to encourage other countries and companies to raise their sights and say, hey, we can do bigger and better, which is great. We, we want a new space race. Um, but we have a, a number of commercial customers for Falcon Heavy, um, so I think um, I really don't think it's going to be in any way an impediment to um, acceptance of national security missions. Because um, we'll, we'll be doing several Falcon Heavy missions, flights per year. So let's say if, if there's a big national security satellite that's due for launch in three or four years, and we probably have like a dozen or, or, or more launches done by then. So it won't really, um, I don't think there'll be a launch number that's, that's an inhibitor on national security stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and then we've, we've got the STP mission that, that's coming up, which is not a, a test mission. That'll go on, full, on a, where everything's on block five, version five of the rocket. Um, and then we'll be launching version five, block five single stick in a couple couple months. So I think it's hopefully smooth sailing for um, qualification for national security missions. Um, our investment to date, uh, probably a lot more than, I, than I'd like to admit. Um, you know, they, we, we try to cancel the Falcon Heavy program three times at SpaceX. Um, because it's like, man, this is way harder than we thought. Because um, the initial idea was just like, oh, you know, you stick on two, uh, you know, two first stages of side boosters. How hard can it be? It's like it's way hard. <laughs> um, we had to redesign the center core completely. Um, we had to redesign the the grid fins because uh, it, 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 it's a lot, long story. But the, if you've got a nose cone on the end of uh, at the end of the booster, instead of a c cylinder, um, you lose control authority um, because if, if you if you've got a cylinder, you can kind of bounce the air off of the rocket, and you get like a 50 percent or more increased control authority if you've got a cylindrical section instead of a an O drive section at the uh, end of the the, the, the booster. 
So we have to redesign the grid fins, redesign the control, the control system, um, massively redesign the thrust structure at the base to take way more load. Um, that center booster has got to uh, deal with uh, over a million pounds of load coming in combined from the side boosters. Um, so it's, it ends up being heavier. Um, so the, the center core is basically a complete redesign. Um, and, and even the side boosters, there's a pretty large number of parts that change. And then the, the, the launch site itself needs to change a lot. I'm guessing our total investment is over half a billion. Probably more. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to take some questions from the phone. Uh, I think the first one up is... I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I think, you know, it's kind of a fun thing. And I sure hope that next bone works, by the way. <laughs> we're not, yeah, we'll know in a few hours. Now we're going to go back to the room, if that's okay. So if um, or, or do ship to ship. We're not sure yet whether ship to ship or um, Brownsville, but most likely it's going to come, do it, happen at our Brownsville location because um, we've got a lot of land with nobody around. Um, so if it blows up, it's cool. Um, but by hopper test, I mean it'll, you know, go up, you know, several miles and then come down. Um, the ship will. The ship is capable of a single stage to orbit if you fully, fully load the tanks. Um, so the, we'll we'll do um, flights of increasing complexity. Um, we really want to test the heat shield material. Something like you know, fly out, turn around, accelerate back real hard, and come in hot um, to test the heat shield because we want to have. Uh, Highly reusable um, heat shield that's capable of absorbing the heat from uh, interplanetary entry velocities. Um, there are a lot of uncertainties on this program, uh, but it is going to be our focus um, after now, now that we're almost done with with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. We're going to uh, uh, level off, as I said, at Block 5 or Version 5. Uh, so there won't be any more major versions of of Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy. Um, Dragon is also going to level off at Dragon version 2. Um, there might be like point releases, you know, 5.1 or Dragon 2.1 or something like that. But most of our engineering resources will be dedicated to uh, VFR. And uh, and so I think that, that will make things go quite quickly. Because um, that's going to come in from uh, super, uh, super, uh, super orbital velocities, like interplanet. Uh, um, you know, Mars transfer velocities, Earth tra Moon transfer velocities. These, these are way harder than coming in from Earth orbit. Um, I mean, there's there's some um, of the the heating things that scale to the the eighth power, which, which I didn't think realized there's anything that scales to the eighth power. Um, but it turns out uh, reentry certain elements of reentry heating uh, scale to the at, at the eighth to the eighth. Um, so just yeah, testing that ship out is the real tricky part. The booster, I think, I don't want to get, you know, complacent, but I think we understand reusable boosters, uh, reusable spaceships that can land propulsively. That's that's harder. So we're starting with the hard part first. I don't know. I think it's conceivable that we do our first test flight in three or four years of a you know full up orbital test flight, including the booster. Uh, but it would be capable of going to the moon shortly thereafter, because th I think I'm I'm pretty sure we're, we'll serve recovery in the next six months. Um, but it turns out, like you you pop the parachute on the fairing, you've got this giant uh, awkward thing. Um, it tends to interfere with the the airflow on the uh, on the parachute, um, and and mess and, and gets all twisty and um, and obviously it was lo a low priority too. Um, also, we have fairing version two, which is the really that's the important one that we want to recover. So even if we recovered fairing version one, um, that that wouldn't be we would be reflying re in the future. Um, so fairing two uh, and and recovery that's very important. Um, and I, I, my guess is next six months we figure out fairing recovery. And we've got a special boat to catch the fairing. It's like a catcher's mitt. It's like a giant catcher's mitt in boat form. Um, 
It's going to run around and catch, catch the fairing, actually. It's kind of fun. I think we might be able to do the same thing with dragon. So unless, if NASA wants us to, we could try to catch a dragon. <laughs> Literally, it's just yeah. meant for the fairing, but it would work on dragon, too. Um, in the room? How in, in, actually, in terms of company priorities, the obviously mission assurance is always number one as a priority, but then number the the, the priority used to be uh, Falcon 9 Block 5, and then a month ago I said absolute priority is Crew Dragon. Um, so we're pretty much done with Falcon 9 Block 5 or version 5. Um, pretty much done, almost done with Falcon Heavy. There's a few um, tweaks that would occur with Falcon Heavy Block 5, but they're minor. And uh, so it's all hands on deck for Crew Dragon. Um, and our, our goal is to, uh, we're aspiring to, to fly crew to orbit uh, at the end of this year. That's our goal. Uh, I think that's, I think the hardware will be ready. And uh, so it's all hands on deck for Crew Dragon. Um, and our, our goal is to, uh, we're aspiring to, to fly crew to orbit uh, at the end of this year. Yeah, so that's a, the center core is a special build. The side boosters we can reuse existing Falcon 9s, but we need to just replace the interstage with a with a nose cone, um, and um, and it needs to use the, uh, to the the upgraded titanium grid fins, which are sweet. Those worked out real well. I'm really happy about those. In fact, I'm glad we got the the side boosters back because they had the titanium grid fins, and the center core didn't. So if I was to pick anyone, I would have picked the side boosters. I, I'd pick the center core to explode. Um, so. <laughs> So that would be like the least, uh, yeah. Because those friggin' grid fins are, <laughs> they're, they're super expensive. And yeah, no, it definitely works though. You can just like jump in a, in a vacuum chamber with it and it's fine. <laughs> Thank you very much right. for your time. Really All right, appreciate thank you. it. All right, thanks everyone. I've had a good time. <laughs> Lots more excitement uh, That, uh, you know, we're doing what we can to uh, have the future be, be as good as possible. Um, to be inspired by what is likely to happen um, and to look forward to the next day. Um, so that's, that's what really, really drives me, is, is, is trying to figure out uh, how, do we, how do we make sure that things are great and, um, and going to be so. And um, that's the underlying principle behind uh, Tesla and SpaceX, um, is that um, I think it's, it's, it's pretty important that we accelerate the transition to uh, sustainable generation and consumption of energy. Um, it, it's inevitable, but it's, it matters if, we ha if it happens sooner or, or later. Um, and then SpaceX is about um, helping make life multiplanetary um, and doing what we can to continue the, the dream of Apollo um, and uh, ultimately make a contribution to life becoming multiplanetary. Well, let's talk a little more about that. I think uh, everyone very interested in that when you say making life multiplanetary. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so what's I your mean, vision there? You know, um, I think, you know, particularly for uh, Americans, you know, like think about America is a nation of explorers. Uh, people came here from other parts of the world that, you know, uh, chose to give up the known in favor of the unknown. Um, so I think uh, exploration, like <clears throat> I think the United States is a, is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. Um, and uh, so that's why it, it appeals to Americans so much. You know, um, you can see this when, say there was a shuttle tragedy um, and seven people died. And that's, that's terrible, but you know, a lot of people die all the time. Um, but, but why do we care so much? Because it was the dream of exploration that was dying uh, along with those people. That's why. No, and I'm one of those, and I'm probably like many of you, remember exactly where you were uh, when that, that tragedy happened. So you have 30 plus governors here today, and we're very excited about uh, your willingness uh, to be with us. And you hopefully heard me talk a little bit about uh, my initiative, which is being ahead of the curve. What do you tell us as governors? What, we, what should we be thinking about in terms of, of innovation and, and developing public policy for the future? Well, um, it, it, 
sure, sure is important to get the, the rules right. Um, and, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, in, in terms of legislative and executive actions, um, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, if you think of, say, like professional sports or something, if you, if you don't have the rules right, if there isn't, uh, uh, you know, um, if, it, if, it, if, it, if, the, if the game isn't set up properly, it's not going to be a, a good game. Um, so it's real important to get the, the rules right. Um, now, I think it's, it's worth noting that I think still um, in the United States, the rules are still better than anywhere else. Um, um, but um, the, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to put something in place which is an inhibitor to, to innovation without realizing it. Um, so in terms of um, the regulatory environment, uh, uh, it's, it's always important to bear in mind that uh, regulations uh, ha are immortal um, and they, 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 they never die unless somebody act actually goes and kills them and then they, they get a lot of momentum. So a lot of times regulations can be put in place for, for all the right reasons, um, but then nobody goes back and gets rid of them afterwards when they no longer make sense. Um, you know, the, uh, and there used to be a rule in the early days when people were concerned about automobiles because that was a pretty scary thing, see a carriage just going wrong by itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know what those things might do. Um, so there were like rules where you had to, in a lot of states, we had to carry a lantern in front of the automobile. Um, and it had to be like 100 paces ahead of the automobile. There had to be someone with a lantern on a pole. <laughs> I'm like, okay. But you really get rid of that regulation. And they did, you know. Because um, <laughs> it would really be awkward. Um, so, um, so just re regulations, even if done correctly and, for, and, and being right at the time, it's always important to go back and, and scrub those, you know, periodically to make sure they're still sensible and they're still serving the greater good. Um, I think uh, in terms of tax structure, to, to what, what, is, what is economically incented and what is, what is not economically incented, just make sure that the incentive structure is, is correct. I, mean, I think I'm saying just totally common sense things here. Um, but um, it's economics 101. Whatever you, whatever you incent will happen. Um, so the, if you incent one thing, that thing will tend to happen more than the other thing. If you incent another thing, that, that thing will happen. Um, and so the, the economics should favor innovation. Um, and, um, and this is particularly important to uh, protect uh, small to medium-sized companies um, because, because it's sort of like trying to grow a tree in a forest. Like it's real hard for a new company to, to grow. Um, when it's just a seedling or a sapling, uh, it needs a lot more protection um, than if it's a giant redwood or something like that. So uh, very important to uh, give support to small, and, and small to medium-sized companies on the innovation front. Um, and um, they're the ones that, that needed more than big companies. And I, I think this point tells us almost big company, biggish company anyway. Um, so I'd favor, you know, supporting uh, smaller companies than Tesla, uh, relatively speaking. What would your response be? Because there are critics out there with regard to incentives. Mm -hmm. And that, sure. and, you know, Tesla has been and I can speak from experience, uh, the, the beneficiary of, of incentives, economic mm -hmm. incentives when, with regard to the, to the gigafactory. Sure. What would yeah. you tell those, those people? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, as you know, the, the, those incentives were um, a little overstated. Um, the, um, the, the, in the case of the gigafactory, it's a, it's a $5 billion investment, capital investment, to get that uh, factory going. Um, and I, I didn't actually know this until, by the way, I didn't, I didn't know this until we did the press conference. Actually, that, that, that over 20 years, the Nevada incentives added up to 1.3 billion. I actually didn't even know this. Uh, but, but, but it's, now he's telling me. <laughs> Go ahead. Literally, I learned it at the press conference. I'm like, really? Um, no, but I mean, it's, the, 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 the thing is that they, they took what added up over 20 years I made it sound like Nevada was writing us a $1.3 billion check. And I'm, you know, I'm still waiting for that check. Uh, it's, <laughs> I'm, did it get lost in the mail? I don't know. Um, 
<laughs> so, uh, but you know, this is the way the press works, of course. Um, so, if, now if you divide 1.3 billion by 20, okay, then it's, it, it's like, okay, Tesla's on average um, rece receives a, 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 a sort of a, a tax, it, it, well, d d d doesn't, it, it's, it's rate basically sales and use tax abatement is, is what it amounts to. Um, so t Tesla gets like on the order, we get on the order of 50 to 60 million of sales and use tax abatement divided over 20 years. Um, and, uh, but, but this is for something which has a $5 billion capital cost uh, just to get going, and then um, would have to generate about $100 billion over that period of time to, to achieve a $1.3 billion uh, tax benefit. So, um, so essentially, it's, it's a little over 1% over that period of time, and that's great, okay? But uh, it's not... Um, you know, it's, it's not like it's it's not the way it was characterized in the press. Um, it, but but if, if because if it's put in the proper context, it sounds like okay. Well, that's neat. You know, it's about five five percent helpful on setting up the factory, and about one percent helpful over the next twenty years. <laughs> cool. That actually sounds pretty reasonable. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah. So so that 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 was that was helpful. But there are a lot of other factors as well. Um, and uh, we actually had slightly bigger incentive packages from, from some other states that were offered, uh, but we factored in um, how quickly could we uh, uh, get the Gigafactory into operation, um, what were the risks associated with uh, that progress, um, uh, what, would the over, what would be the logistics costs over time of transferring battery packs and powertrains to a, a vehicle factory in uh, California. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and all of those factors weighed together um, is what, may, uh, is what um, led us to make the decision in favor of Nevada. Um, and, and working with, with, with your team was great. Uh, it was very forward-leaning. Um, and um, and like a, a big part was also just like making you know, sure you feel really welcome, you know, uh, within, within the state. Um, so, um, that's sort of what, what led us to make the decision for the Gigafactory. Um, and then, um, then we have another factory in, in, in New York doing uh, solar panels. Um, also, actually, it will be the biggest solar uh, panel producer in North America when it's done. Um, and then we expect us to establish probably at least uh, two or three more uh, Gigafactories in the U.S. in the next several years. Um, as well as uh, a couple overseas. Um, but the overall objective of Tesla it, it's, is, is really what, what set of actions can we take to accelerate the advent of sustainable production and consumption of energy? Um, and um, I, I think the, the, the sort of, the way, the way I would assess the historic good of Tesla is in terms of, of, how, of what that, how many years of acceleration was it? You know, and if we can accelerate sustainable energy by 10 years, I would consider that to be a great success. Hope, even if it was only five years, that would still be pretty good. Um, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the overarching optimization. So you, you've talked about interplanetary travel and sustainable energy and the vehicles a little bit. What, what would you want things to look like in five to ten years associated with, with energy sure. and with autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles? Hmm. Well, I think things are going to be, they're going to grow exponentially. So there's a big difference between five and ten years. Um, you know, my, my guess is, uh, yeah, probably in 10 years, more than a half of uh, new vehicle um, production is electric in the United States. Um, and China's probably going to be ahead of that, because China's been super pro-EV. Um, I don't think a lot of people know this, but like, I mean, China's environmental policies are way ahead of the US. Like Their mandate for renewable energy far exceeds the US. 
I think this, sometimes people are under the impression that China is uh, either dragging their feet or, or somehow behind the U.S. in terms of um, sustainable energy promotion, but they're, they're by far the most aggressive on Earth. It's crazy. I mean, like, in fact, the a, a coalition of Chinese car manufacturers just wrote the Chinese government to beg for them to slow down the mandate. Because like, it's like too much. They, they need to make 8% electric vehicles, I think, like next year or in two years or something. This is like, they can't physically do it. Um, so China's by far the most aggressive on um, electric vehicles and solar. Um, so, um, but that's a common misperception that they're not. Um, there's one Google search way to figure this out, by the way. It's really pretty straight, pretty easy. So, and in ten, in ten, yeah, ten years, man. I think, yeah, yeah. So ha half of all production, I think, will be, be EV. I think almost all cars produced will be autonomous in ten years. Almost all. It will be rare to find one that is not in ten years. Um, that's going to be a huge transformation. Um, now, the thing to bear in mind, though, is that new vehicle production is only about 5% the size of the vehicle fleet. So you think about how long does a car or truck last? And they last 15 to 20 years so before they're finally scrapped. So new vehicle production is only roughly, one, at, at most, 1 15th of the, the fleet size. So even when new vehicle production, say, switches, those, switches over to electric or to autonomous, that still means the vast majority of the fleet on the roads is not. It'll take another you know, five to 10 years before that becomes majority, the majority of the fleet becomes EV or uh, uh, autonomous. Um, but if you were to say go out 20 years, overwhelmingly things are electric autonomous, overwhelmingly. Fully autonomous? Fully autonomous. So no one will have to touch the steering wheel if there is one? There will not be a steering wheel. <laughs> In 20 years, um, it will be like having a horse. People have horses, which is cool. Um, but so, so having a regular car will be like having a horse. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there will be people that have, that have you know, non-autonomous cars, like people have horses. <laughs> <laughs> it just would be unusual to use that as a mode of transport. Yes, all right. Now, let's talk about um, the energy piece and rooftop solar and storage. Um, yeah. Um, so the. Uh, I mean, first of all, it's <clears throat> important to appreciate that the Earth is almost entirely solar powered today, um, in the sense that the sun is the only thing that keeps us from. Um, being at roughly the temperature of cosmic background radiation, which is three degrees above absolute zero. If it wasn't for a sun, we'd be a frozen dark uh, ice bowl. Um, and the, uh, the amount of energy, so the amount of energy that, hits the sun, that reaches us from the sun is tremendous. It's, it's, over, it's, the, it's 99 percent plus of all energy that, that Earth has. Um, then there's, 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 there's this energy we need to used to run civilization, which to us is big, but compared to the amount of energy that reaches us from the sun is tiny. Um, so it, it, it's very easy, like it actually doesn't take much. If, if, you, if you wanted to power the entire United States with solar panels, um, it would take um, a, a fairly small corner of Nevada, Texas, Utah, anywhere. Uh, look, you, it's, it, you only need about 100 miles by 100 miles of solar panels to power the entire United States. Um, and then the, the batteries you need to store that energy to make sure you have 24-7 um, uh, power is uh, one mile by one mile. The one, one square mile. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. That's, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I showed the graph of the, or, or image of this where uh, this is what 100 miles by 100 miles looks like. It's like you know, a little square on the U.S. map, um, and then one, there's a little pixel inside there, and that's the size of the battery pack that you need to support that. Real tiny. So, Will, you, you talked about 20 years from now, none of us 
Will some people still be using horses or? or it won't be we, zero. Yeah, but it's so, too rare. So what will the, the energy piece look like? I mean, what will there be transmission lines? Will there mm -hmm. be a need? Yeah, I think the so there's the, it, it, use of energy can, is roughly divided into three areas. Um, and they're more or less equal um, at, a, at a high level. Um, there's about a third of energy is used for transportation of various kinds. About a third is used uh, for electricity. About a third is used for heating. So if you want to have, uh, and, and then of, of, of the electricity production, call it you know, something on the order of 10%, depending upon how you count it, is renewable. Maybe 15%. Um, uh, today, so th that means that there's a massive amount of solar that would need pe need to be produced um, and connected in order to to be fully sustainable. Because fully sustainable means you're tackling transport, um, non-renewable electricity generation, and heating. Um, so that that means there will need to be a combination of utility-scale solar and rooftop scale solar combined with uh, wind, geothermal, uh, hydro, probably some, some nuclear for a while, um, in order to transition to a sustainable uh, situation. Um, which means, really for the most part, massive, massive growth in solar. Um, and it's, it's going to be important to have rooftop solar in uh, neighborhoods, um, because otherwise you're gonna, there'll need to be uh, massive new transmission lines built. And people do not like having transmission lines go through the neighborhood. They really don't like that. And I agree. <laughs> so um, so you, you want to have some localized energy uh, production um, combined with utility. It's, so you want rooftop solar, utility solar, um, and uh, that, that's, that's really going to be the solution from a physics standpoint, but I can't see any other way to really do it. Um, um, people talk a lot about fusion and all that, but the sun is a giant fusion reactor in the sky, and it's really reliable. It comes up every day. Um, <laughs> so, if it doesn't, we've got bigger problems. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me to ask you this. We, we talked about workforce today, but they asked me, are robots going to take our jobs, everybody's jobs in the future? Or how, how much do you see it's artificial ideal. intelligence coming into the, the workplace? Um, well, first of all, I, I think on the artificial intelligence front, um, you know, I, I have exposure to the very, the very most cutting edge um, AI. Um, uh, and I think people should be really concerned about it. Um, I keep so sounding the alarm bell, but you know, until people see like robots going down the street killing people, like, they don't know how to react you know, because it seems so ethereal. Um, and um, I think we should be really concerned about AI, and I think we should... Yeah, this is, AI is a rare case where I think we need to be proactive in regulation instead of reactive. Um, because I think by the time we are reactive in AI regulation, it's too late. Um, and no, normally the way regulations are set up is that a whole bunch of bad things happen, there's a public outcry, the, the, and then after many years, a regulatory agency is set up to regulate that industry. Um, and there's a bunch of opposition from companies who don't like being told what to do by regulators. Um, anyway, it takes forever. Um, that, then that, in the past, ha has been bad, but not um, something which represented a uh, you know, a fundamental risk to the existence of civilization. AI is a fundamental risk to the existence of human civilization. Um, in a way that car accidents, uh, airplane crashes, um, faulty drugs, uh, or bad food were, were not. They were, not they, they were harmful to, to uh, a set of individuals within society, of course, but they were not harmful to society as a whole. Um, AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization, and I don't think people fully appreciate that. Um, 
you know, it's not, it's not fun being regulated. It's not, you know, uh, could be pretty irksome. But, uh, you know, in the car business, you know, we get regulated uh, by Department of Transport, by EPA, and a bunch of others. Um, and, and there's regulatory agencies in every, every country. You know, in the in space, that the, we get regulated by FAA, um, and um, but but you know, if you ask the average person, hey, you want to do you want to get rid of the FAA um, and just like take a, take a chance on manufacturers not cutting corners on the aircraft because uh, you know profits were down that quarter? Uh, I was like, eh, hell no, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I think even people who are pretty you know, extremely like libertarian free market, they'd be like, yeah, we should probably have somebody keeping an eye on the aircraft companies, making sure they build a good aircraft um, and good cars and that kind of thing. So, you know, I think there's, there's a role for regulators. Um, that's very important. Um, and I'm against overregulation for sure. Uh, but, man, we've, I think we've got to get on that with AI pronto. Um, and uh, so, so there'll certainly be a lot of job disruption um, because what's going to happen is robots will be able to do everything better than us. I'm, inclu I'm including, I mean, all of us, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what to do about this. <laughs> um, it's like, the, it's the, like it, this is really like the scariest problem to me. I tell you, um, and um, yeah. So I really think we need government regulation here, just to because this is, you know, ensuring the public good is served. Because you've got companies that are racing; that they kind of have to race to build AI, or they're going to be uh, made uncompetitive. You know, like the, essentially, if your competitor is racing to build AI and you don't, they will crush you. So then you're like, ah, we don't want to be crushed. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I guess we need to build it too. Um, that's where you need the regulators to come in and say, hey guys, um, you all need to really, you know, just pause and make sure this is safe. And like when, when it's cool and, we're and the regulators are convinced that it's safe to proceed, then you can go. But otherwise, slow down. Um, and, but, long, but you kind of need the regulators to do that for, for all the teams in the game, you know. Uh, Otherwise, the shareholders will be saying, like, hey, why aren't you developing AI faster? Um, because your competitor is. I'm like, uh, okay, we better do that. Um, anyway, so it's like, I mean, there's like something like 12% of jobs are transport. Transport will be one of the first things to go fully autonomous. But when I say everything, like, the robots will be able to do everything, bar, bar nothing. Let's move back to your rolling out the Model 3 this year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and how many orders? What, did, what is that going to look like? Um, yeah, it's going well on that front. Um, we got, uh, I don't know, more. I think like if somebody orders a Model 3 today, they'd only get it probably late next year. Um, we just actually just started production. We made the first production unit last week. Um, and... Uh, the thing that is, is not well appreciated about um, something about, about cars and any kind of new technology is how hard it is to do the manufacturing. It is vastly harder to do the manufacturing by a factor of a hundred, like a hundred, than to, to make the to make that car to make one of something. Now, with with maybe fifty or sixty people, we could make a prototype of practically anything in six months. Um, now to manufacture that thing, we need 5,000 people to spend, you know, three years, and that's considered really fast. So, uh, manufacturing will, does this kind of S curve where it's excruciatingly slow at first, and then it it grows exponentially, um, and then uh, but people tend to extrapolate on a straight line. So if it's real slow at first, they say, "Oh, it's real slow. Look at that. They're only going to make five cars a week forever." Like, nope. Uh, It'll be 10 cars a week, then 20 cars a week, then you know, 40 cars a week, then 5,000 cars a week eventually. Um, just grows crazy fast. 
Uh, so we're hoping to get to you know something uh, you know like 5,000 cars a week by the end of the year. Well, um, I wanted to give an opportunity for some of the governors to ask questions and perhaps some audience questions. Um, I, I was told that you'd be willing to, yeah, to do absolutely. that. Yeah, Great. So, uh, governors, any questions for, for Elon? Governor Scott. Well, thank you very much. Um, we in Vermont have uh, partnered with Tesla in, uh, in terms of a power pack in, in our homes, and it's yeah. for $15 a day. Uh, you can rent this for 15 years, and it'll, it'll carry power as a backup generation device for 12 hours, and it's been really, really interesting from my perspective. Uh, but I'm curious about vehicles and, and where we're going in the future, uh, or how far in the future do the cars themselves become uh, the charging device, like the, the roof and deck lids and, and hood, or, does, or do the batteries get so efficient that you don't need that, and then you just power up for a week or something like that? Where are we going in the future? with battery storage? Yeah, I think the future is, it's, there's just there's three legs to the stool. Uh, there's uh, electric cars, there's a stationary battery pack, um, and solar power. Uh, with those three things, you can have a completely sustainable energy future. Uh, that's, all, that's all that's needed. On the, sol on the solar front, like I said, uh, it's going to be a combination of rooftop solar and utility scale solar. Um, you'll need both because of the you know, enormous demand for electricity. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the things that's, that's been missing, I think, up till now is having rooftop solar that looks good um, and isn't, an, uh, you know, um, that, that's where we've got the, the solar glass roof that we're developing. Um, and we're doing it in different styles so that it, it, you know, it matches the aesthetics of a, of a particular house or um, so regional style. Um, that's, I think that's actually pretty important. Um, and... Um, but conventional flat panel solars will, will, for, for flat roofs and for commercial will be uh, the, way, the way to go. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and, and putting solar panels on the, on the car itself, not that, uh, not that helpful because the actual surface area of the car is not, not very much and cars are very often indoors. Um, and so it's the least efficient place to put solar is on the car. Just wondering about maybe a wrap of some sort, is that, is that make any sense in the future, like a, a wrap of solar around either a building made of a solar panel or a wrap of a, of a vehicle actually being the solar panel but being the, the components of the vehicle itself? I, I don't think so. Um, I'll scrap that idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, just, uh, it's just way better to put it on a roof, uh, for sure. Um, I, I, I really thought about this. I mean, really, and I pushed my team about, like, isn't there some way we could do it on the car? Um, I mean, the, the, technically, if you have like some sort of transformer-like thing, which will pop out of the trunk like like a, a you know like a hard top convertible, and just like like ratchet solar panels over the whole surface area of the car, extending like for the entire say uh, square footage of a parking space, um, provided you're in the sun, uh, that would be enough to generate about 20 to 30 miles a day of electricity, but uh, that is for sure the expensive, difficult way to do it. <laughs> right. Governor Berga. Still thought about it. Maybe we should. But. Elon, thank, thanks for being here. Uh, with your background in payment systems, uh, you understand uh, the important role of uh, security and transactions. Uh, yeah. Now that you've got... I, I think security is a... Cyber security? Yes, and you're in, in, a, in, a, in the vehicles you're building now are incredibly complex software systems. I mean, the car is really yep. a rolling piece of software. It is. It's like a laptop on wheels. Yes. So uh, share with us a little bit about uh, your thoughts on cybersecurity and how, you, how, you, how, how we protect. Uh, you talk about protecting society when uh, yep. you've got a rolling fleet of... Um, I, I think one of the biggest uh, risks for autonomous vehicles is somebody achieving um, a fleet-wide hack. Um, you know, in principle, if, if somebody was able to hack, say, all of the autonomous Teslas, they could say, I mean, just as a prank, they could say, like, send them all to Rhode Island <laughs> from across the United States. <laughs> and they'd be like, well, okay, that would be the end of Tesla. <laughs> um, and <laughs> there'd be a lot of angry people in Rhode Island, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so uh, we've got to make super sure that, uh, that 
a, a fleet-wide hack is basically impossible, and that if people are in the car, that they have uh, override authority on uh, whatever the car is doing. So if the car is doing something wacky, uh, you can press a button that no amount of software can override that will ensure that the, uh, you, you, you gain control of the vehicle um, and kind of cut, cut the link to the servers. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty fundamental. Um, Within the car, we actually have, even if somebody gains access to the car, there are multiple subsystems within the car that, that, that also have uh, specialized encryption. So the powertrain, for example, has specialized encryption. So even if somebody would gain access to the car, they cannot gain access to the powertrain or to the braking system. Um, and, um, but it is my top, top concern from a security standpoint at Tesla is making sure that fleet-wide hack or any vehicle-specific hack can occur. The, the same, the, they have the same problem with cell phones. Um, you know, uh, if we're, it's, it's kind of crazy today that we live quite uh, comfortably in, in, a, in a world that George Orwell would have thought was super crazy. Um, like, we, we, we all carry um, a phone with a, with, with a microphone that can be turned on really at any time without our knowledge with a GPS that knows our position, um, and a camera, um, and, uh, well, kind of all of our personal information. Um, we do this um, willingly, um, and uh, it's kind of wild to think that that's the case. Um, so so pho the, the phone, like Apple and, and uh, Google kind of have the same challenge of making sure there cannot be a fleet-wide hack or a system-wide hack of phones um, or, or a specific hack. So that, that's our top, our top concern. Um, yeah, it become a, it's going to become a bigger and bigger concern. It, I think Tesla's, um, I, don't, I don't want to have fate here, but Tesla's, Tesla's pretty good at software compared to the other car companies. Um, and um, so I do I think it's going to be a bit, like an even bigger challenge for, for the other car companies to ensure security. Yeah. Thank you. Governor Dugard. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Mr. Musk, thank you for speaking to all the governors today. It's, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, one question I had, uh, we saw when gasoline prices went to three and a half dollars a gallon, there was a big jump in interest in hybrid vehicles, sure. and, and uh, you saw those vehicles become very much in demand and then as gasoline prices have fallen you've seen a reversal of that and I'm wondering to what extent uh, you have a concern about the future of electric vehicles in the face of those very low prices. Can you speak to that? Well, the, the, the economics um, uh, they, they, they kind of set, set the slope of the, the, the curve. Um, so there's no question in my mind whatsoever that all transport, with the ironic exception of rockets, will go fully electric. Um, everything. Um, planes, trains, automobiles, well, tra a lot of trains are already electric, um, all, all ships, um, and, um, but it's a question of what that time frame is. And the economic uh, incentive structure drives that time frame. Um, that's really what it amounts to. Um, you know, there's, there's the, 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 and the big challenge is that there's an unpriced externality in the cost of fossil fuels. Uh, so, the un unpriced externality is the uh, the the probably weighted uh, harm that, of changing the chemical constituency of the uh, atmosphere and oceans. Um, it, it, it's, since it is not captured in the price of gasoline, um, it does not uh, drive the right behavior. Um, you know, it would be like uh, if tossing out garbage was just free and, you know, there was no penalty. You just do as much as you want and, like, streets would be full of garbage. Um, so, um, and we regulated a lot of other things like sulfur emissions and nitrous oxide emissions and that kind of thing. It's done, done a lot of good on that front. Um, with CO2, it's tough because there's so many vested interests on the sort of fossil fuel side. Um, 
And sometimes I think I feel like those guys feel like kind of hard done by because uh, um, you know it wasn't obvious like when they were creating their oil and gas companies that it would be bad for the environment. Um, and they worked really hard to create those companies. And then they feel like, well, now they're being kind of attacked on moral grounds. Um, when they didn't originally start those oil companies or, or, or build them up on, on bad moral grounds. Um, and, and, it, and it is true that we cannot instantaneously change to a sustainable situation. Um, but then those guys will also fight pretty hard to slow down the change. And that's really where I think is morally wrong. Go to Governor Bevin and then De Governor Hutchinson. Then we'll take a couple, oh, and then Governor Hickenlooper, and then we'll take some audience questions. Governor Bevin. Elon, Elon thank you for being here. Uh, short version of the question, and then slightly longer. The short version is, do you ever feel pressure by others' expectations of you and your endeavors in light of the progress you've made thus far is the short version. And, and, and more specifically, when you look just at Tesla alone, and you look at a company with a $54 billion valuation, uh, right. and seemingly by typical market metrics, no justifiable reason for that. What are you saying? Does, I'm just saying, I'm <laughs> sir, curious. Sir. I'm just, in all seriousness, do you feel a, a, a concern ever that your intellect and your intellectual curiosity and your ingenuity cannot be matched by those that are trying to commercialize it? Does that ever affect how you think or decisions that you make? Uh, well, it, it is actually, I find it quite uh, tough um, when there are very high expectations. Um, I try to actually tamp down those expectations as you know, to be possible. In fact, I've gone on record several times as saying that the stock price is higher than we have any right to deserve. Um, uh, and that's for sure true based on you know, where we are today and have been in the past. So the stock price obviously ref reflects a lot of optimism about where Tesla will be in the future. Um, and now the, the thing that makes that um, you know, quite a difficult emotional hardship for me uh, is, is that you know, those expectations sometimes get out of, out of control. And I'm like, I hate disappointing people. Um, and so I'm like trying real hard to meet those expectations. But that's a pretty tall order. Um, and uh, a lot of times it's real not, really not fun. I have to say, a whole lot less fun than it may seem. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't ever sell any stock unless I have to for, for taxes. Um, so, you know, I've said publicly, I'm not going to, like, take money off the table. You know, I'll be last. I'm going down with, I'm going down with the ship. So, uh, I'll be the last to do it. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, oh, I really wouldn't recommend anyone start a card company. <laughs> I really wouldn't recommend <laughs> it. It's not a recipe for happiness and freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Governor Bevan. Governor Hutchinson. <laughs> Mr. Musk, uh, Asa Hutchinson from Arkansas. Thank you for your uh, frank observations about uh, exploration. Uh, you know, I look at uh, the spirit of... In uh, invention and the spirit of exploration, which is really the hallmark of America. What is your comment on NASA, its mission? I was in Congress, I supported NASA, but I always feel like it's floundering, does not have the support of the American people that's needed. Uh, what, uh, what's your comment on NASA, its mission, and what advice would you give us? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I should say I'm a big fan of NASA. Um, in fact, at one point, my password was, I love NASA. Uh, <laughs> literally, that was my password. Um, um, and, um, you know, I think the, um, NASA, NASA does a lot of good things for which, peop for which it doesn't get enough credit, um, and that the public, I guess, doesn't know that much about. Um, I like a lot, you know, most members of the public they're not really into hard science, you know. It's like not—it's not the the thing they're tuning in for most of the time. Um, 
I love hard science, you know, uh, but uh, um, it's not that popular. So, uh, but there's great things in terms of the, the telescopes like the Hubble and the James Webb and the, you know, the rovers on Mars um, and uh, the pro, you know, probes to the outer solar system. Um, those are all like really great things. Um, but to get the public excited, you've got to get people in the picture. Um, it just, it's just a uh, hundred times different if there are people in the picture. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if there's some criticism of NASA, it's like, I, it's like important to remember people in the picture, you know, if you want to get the public support. Um, and, um, but, but like, if, if you talk to a scientist about that, they say, like, well, where's the science in that? Like, you're not getting it. It's like, that's not why people are giving you money. <laughs> it's not, that's, I mean, it's a little bit of the reason, but uh, the, 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 like the, the, the serious scientists are like, people just make things more expensive. Uh, like, why do we have people? Like, okay, well, why do we have people at all? <laughs> or anywhere? Um, sometimes the scientists are the ones who just don't, don't understand. Um, even though they're like smart people, but like, you know. Um, so you gotta have something that's gonna fire up the, you know, Fire, fire people up and get them really excited. And like, I think if we were, had a serious goal of having a base on the moon and sending people to Mars, um, and said, okay, this is, we're gonna be outcome oriented. How are we gonna do this? Okay, we gotta change the way contracting is done. Uh, you can't do these like cost plus contracts, cost plus sole source contracts, because then the incentive structure is all messed up. So. Uh, as soon as you don't have any competition, well, okay, there's no essential st urgency goes away. And as soon as you make something a cost plus contract, you're incenting the contractor to maximize the costs of the program because they get a percentage. So they never want that gravy train to end, and they want to make it a, 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 they become cost maximizers. Um, and then you have good people engaged in cost maximization because you just gave them incentive to do that <laughs> and told them they'll get punished if they don't. Essentially, that's what happens. So it's critically important that we change the contracting structure to be a um, competitive commercial bid. Make sure that there are always, there are always two, at least two entities um, that, that are competing to serve NASA um, and that the contracts are milestone based with, with uh, concrete milestones. PowerPoint presentations do not count. Um, like everything works in PowerPoint, okay? <laughs> Except I have a teleportation device. Look, here's my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so, uh, milestone-based competitive uh, commercial contracts with, with competitors, and then, and then you've got to be prepared to fire one of those competitors if they're not, if they're not cutting it, and, and recompete the rest of the remainder of that contract. And by the way, NASA's actually already done this, and they did it with the, commer with the uh, commercial cargo uh, transportation to the space station. Um, and that was a case where NASA, you know, the NASA actually, I'm, I'm not sure if they thought it would work or not work, but they didn't have the budget to do anything else. So they're like, okay, we're going to try this competitive commercial milestone based contracting, and it worked great. Um, and they awarded it uh, to two companies, to, to SpaceX and a company called Kistler. And SpaceX managed to meet, meet the milestones, Kistler did not, so then they, NASA recompeted the remainder of the contract to. Uh, orbital Sciences, but then or Orbital Sciences got across the finish line. So now NASA's got two suppliers for uh, taking cargo to the space station, um, and it's a great situation. Same thing for co commercial crew to the space station. NASA competed that. Um, uh, in, 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 the, in the commercial crew case, it's SpaceX and Boeing. Um, and I think that's also a good situation. So now, um, like I can tell you, like the SpaceX team is like, we're going to do this before Boeing. That's for sure. <laughs> and then, like, I bet at the Boeing team, they're like, we're going to do this before SpaceX. Um, that's good. That's a, it's a good forcing function to get things done. But that, I can't tell you how important that contracting structure is. That is night and day. Um, there's way too much uh, in, in government which is uh, where it's a sole source uh, cost plus contract. Um, that, that just. In, Again, economics 101, whatever you incent, well, that will happen. And people shouldn't be surprised. It's like, oh, you just, you know. 
said, okay, if, if that company manages to find some excuse to double the cost of the contract, they're going to get double the profit because they're getting a percentage. So they're going to do, they're going to do exactly that. Um, and, and also, they're not going to say no to requirements. So the government will come up with some set of requirements. 90% 90 of them could make a lot of sense, and 10% of them are cockamamie that double the, the, the price of the, of the, of the, the project. For those 10% of cockamamie <laughs> requirements in a cost plus contract, the contractor will always say yes. There could be a future for you in, in government contracting at the state level. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Governor Hickenlooper and then Governor Ducey. So then, uh, I think like most governors, I, I find it so refreshing to have the unbridled truth, but I do suspect every time you say publicly that the stock price is higher than we have any right to believe, I, I am going to guess you probably get some calls from investors suggesting that maybe you don't say that so frequently. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I wanted to go back and just, just briefly, because I think I, I wrote this down, that you said that uh, artificial intelligence is the, the fundamental existential risk facing civilization. Did I get that close I enough? Think I, in, in my opinion, it is, it is the biggest risk that we face as a civilization is artificial intelligence. And so, to a group of leaders, what would you advise that we should, how should we be addressing something that's, that's a, such a large landscape and yet obviously so important? Um, I think that the, you know, one of the roles of government is to ensure the public good um, it, and, and to, uh, that dangers to the, the, the public are addressed. Um, so that hence the regulatory thing. I think the, the first order of business would be to try to learn as much as possible, you know, to understand the nature of the issues, to um, look closely at the progress that is being made um, and the remarkable um, achievements of artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, last year, uh, uh, Go, which is a, a quite a difficult game to beat, um, that people thought would never be beaten with uh, um, by, by a computer, that, 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 a computer, that a computer would either never beat the best human player or that it was 20 years away. Um, and last year, um, uh, AlphaGo, which was done by DeepMind, which is a kind of a Google subsidiary, um, absolutely crushed the world's best player. Um, and now, now, but now it can crush, it can play at the top 50 simultaneously and crush them all. So, just like that pace of progress is remarkable. Um, and um, and there's, you can see more and more coming out. I think the robotics, uh, you can see robots that can learn to walk from, from nothing, um, you know, within hours, like way faster than any biological being. Um, um, but the, the, the thing that's uh, most dangerous is, uh, and, and it's the hardest to kind of wrap, um, kind of get your arms around because it's not a physical thing, is kind of a deep intelligence in the network. Um, he said, well, what harm could a deep intelligence in the network do? So, well, it could start a war um, by, create, by doing fake news and spoofing email accounts and fake press releases and just by, you know, manipulating information. The pen is mightier than the sword. Um, so, uh, I mean, as an example, I want, to be, I want to emphasize, I do not think this actually occurred. This is purely a hypothetical that I... <laughs> well, I'm digging my grave here. Um, <laughs> um, but you know that, like that, there was that second Malaysian airliner that was shot down uh, on the uh, Ukrainian-Russian border? Um, and that, that really amplified tensions between Russia and the, the EU um, in, in a massive way. Well, I, I, let's say if, if you had uh, an AI that was, uh, where the AI's goal was to maximize the value of a portfolio of stocks, um, one of the ways to maximize value would be to uh, go uh, long on defense, short on consumer, start a war. Um, and then uh, how could it do that? Well, you know, hacking into the Malaysian Airlines uh, 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 rat aircraft routing server, route it over a war zone, um, then send an anonymous tip 
that an enemy uh, aircraft is flying overhead right now. Let's go to Governor Ducey and then <laughs> we'll have after Governor Ducey, we'll finish our uh, gubernatorial questions and then two questions, and then we quick questions or one audience question, and then we'll be done. We're, we're running short on time. Governor Ducey. Thanks, Elon. I really enjoyed your comments today. And as someone who has spent a lot of time in his administration trying to reduce and eliminate regulations, uh, I was surprised by your suggestion to bring reg regulations before we know exactly what we're dealing with with mm -hmm. AI. <clears throat> You know, and I've, I've heard the example used, uh, if I were to come up with a colorless, odorless, uh, tasteless gas that was explosive, people would say, well, you have to ban that, and then we'd have no natural gas. So you've given some of these examples of how a AI can be an existential threat, but I still don't understand as policymakers what type of regulations beyond slow down, which typically... Um, Policymakers don't get in, in front of entrepreneurs or innovators. Well, I think the first order of business would be to gain insight. Right now, the government does not even have insight. Um, and I, I think the, the right order of business would be to stand up a regulatory agency, initial goal, gain insight into the status of um, AI activity. Um, uh, make sure it, the situation is, is understood. Um, once it is, then put regulations in place to ensure public safety. That's it. Um, and for sure, the companies doing AI will, will most of them, not mine, uh, will squawk and say, hey, uh, this is really going to stifle innovation, blah, 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 it's going to move to China. It won't. Um, and uh, it won't because like, it's like, has, like, has Boeing moved to China? Nope. They're pulling aircraft here. Um, uh, same on, on cars. Um, and so it's not, it's um, the, the notion that if you establish a regulatory regime, that companies will just simply move to um, countries with, with lower regulatory comments is, is false on the face of it because none of them do. Unless it's really overbearing. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about, you know make sure that there is awareness at the government level. Um, I think once there is awareness, people will be extremely afraid, as they should be. All right, one audience question. We'll take the first hand that came up. All right here. Thanks, Elon. Ina Fried with Axios. Early on in this administration, you had argued pretty vociferously that it was best to engage and better to be in the room than not be in the room. Uh, then when the president decided to pull out of Paris, you said that was kind of the last straw and you were going to drop off. Mm -hmm. What drove you to that? And if you were still speaking to him today, what would you say to the president? Well, I, I thought it was worth uh, doing, you know, trying hard to... Um, you know, to, to do what's worth, it was worth trying. I got a lot of flack for, um, from multiple fronts for even trying. Um, you when know, some guy ran at billboards and like uh, attacking me and like full page ads in the New York Times and whatnot, um, just for just for being on the panel. Um, and and you know, in every in every meeting, I was like just trying to make the arguments um, in favor of sustainability um, and. Uh, you know, sometimes other issues like we need to make sure that our immigration laws are not unkind or unreasonable um, and uh, you know did my best and I, I think in a few cases I did actually make some progress which gave me uh, some encouragement to continue um, but, but then I just really think that the Paris Accord man I, I'm, I'm, if I stayed on the councils then I'd be essentially saying that that wasn't important, but it was super important um, because I think a country needs to keep its word. Um, and, you know, that, that's, it's not even a binding agreement. So we could always, like, slow it down. Um, you know, the, the argument that there would be job losses, well, we could see if there are job losses before we exit the agreement. And maybe there won't be job losses. Maybe there'll be job gains. Um, 
But yeah, there's just no way I could stay on after that. <laughs> so, you know, did my best. All right. All right, well, everybody, if you would please join me in thanking Elon for being here.